Okay. <clears throat> well, all right. I believe we have mastered the technology. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is David Fott. I'm a professor of political science and director of the Great Works Academic Certificate Program here at UNLV. Uh, the Great Works Academic Certificate Program exists to encourage undergraduates to spend as much time as possible with the greatest minds who have ever lived, whether they're uh, alive or dead. Uh, a nine-page list of those minds can be found on our website, Great Works Academic Certificate, which you can get from a Google search or through the UNLV homepage. The program requires 12 credits of courses featuring primary sources written by authors on our list. It's a way to certify that you've taken rigorous courses and to impress graduate schools and employers. Uh, the program also has a book club that any student may join at any time. It meets tomorrow uh, at 4 o'clock, in fact. And there's more information about that on the website. Um, we have a series of guest lectures that you've received information about. This is the first in a series of five this semester, so I hope you'll be able to join us for those. So uh, feel free to contact me if you want more information. I am most grateful that funding for today's lecture has come from the Jack Miller Center for Teaching America's Founding Principles and History. Our speaker today, Lorraine Smith Pangle, is professor of government and co-director of the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Study of Core Texts and Ideas at the University of Texas at Austin. Her teaching and research interests uh, focus on the history of political and moral philosophy with a special concern for Homer, Plato, Xenophon, Aristotle, and the American founders. Her most recent book is Reason and Character, the Moral Foundations of Aristotelian Political Philosophy. She is also the author of Aristotle and the Philosophy of Friendship, Virtue is Knowledge, the Moral Foundations of Socratic Political Philosophy, the Political Philosophy of Benjamin Franklin, and co-authored with Thomas Pangle, The Learning of Liberty, the Educational Ideas of the American Founders. She's held fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and the Earhart Foundation. Her topic for today is Lessons for a Political Animal, Aristotle's Advice to Americans, if you'll pardon the anachronism. But I will point out that this talk is being recorded. So now please join me in welcoming Professor Pangle. Thank you very much, David. Can everybody hear me? OK. Well, I'm very pleased to be here in your exciting city for the first time. I got a nice tour downtown today. And especially pleased to have a chance to try out some thoughts I've been exploring along a more practical vein than most of the work that I do. What Aristotle would say if we could call him back from a couple thousand years ago to give us some advice for our troubled democracy. Just a generation ago, after the Cold War ended, liberal democracy was advancing around the world so impressively that it seemed to have no serious ideological rivals left. There were still a few communist regimes and lots of authoritarian ones, but democracy seemed to be what everybody wanted prompting Francis Fukuyama to proclaim that we had reached the end of history, the point at which all the great questions in human history had been in principle solved, even if it might take a while for those principles to work themselves out everywhere. Now, a short 30 years later, liberal democracy is in retreat abroad and in trouble here at home. The ills of our democracy include deepening divides between left and right and between rich and poor, 
educated and uneducated, gridlock in Congress, growing vitriol, broken trust in our institutions, sharp increases in anxiety and depression and a sense of alienation, and a decline in the belief in liberal democracy, especially among young people. Commentators have all their favorite culprits, including globalization, meritocracy, breeding out of touch elites, the primary system empowering irresponsible populists, the erosion of norms in the House and Senate, entrenched racism, identity politics, and social media. And all of these diagnoses have some plausibility and lots of good remedies have been proposed. But what's most ominous is the decline of a common purpose, a shared American vision of human thriving and the kind of country that deserves our dedication and the kind of citizens we should aspire to be. If we had this, we could navigate our differences constructively, but we don't have it. For most of our history, we've had more agreement on our core principles. The principle of equality under the law, equality of opportunity, a limited government whose first task was to protect Americans' freedoms and rights. Our worst divisions have come not around our basic principles so much as in our failure to extend them to everybody. We still share a commitment to equality and liberal liberty and rights, but we don't agree anymore on what they mean. Is the equality that matters equal prosperity for everyone or equal opportunity to achieve unequal results? Is it equal representation of every ascriptive group in every profession and organization? Or is the love of equality at bottom just a hatred for elites? Does freedom mean minimal government interference in individual choices? Or does it mean vigorous government intervention to protect the formerly excluded and marginalized? Do rights include the right to life or the right to abortion? to own guns or to be secure from violence, to earn and spend as we choose, or to get help with all of basics, life's basic needs. Our very agreements have become the issues around which we're most divided. In perplexity, it's always good to go back to first principles. And when we turn back to the American founding with these divisions in mind, we find three great paradoxes. The first paradox is that our constitutional system has worked impressively well on faulty premises, I would argue, about human nature. Our founders devised an enormously beneficial system of government built around the rule of law, equality under the law, extensive individual freedoms, many of them enshrined as constitutional rights, representation through democratic elections, separation of powers, especially an independent judiciary, and federalism, and the benefits that all this has brought have been terrific advances in peace and security and health and prosperity and toleration and the protections of citizens against oppression. The premises that once provided the theoretical basis for this project of liberal democracy all begin with the state of nature. Hobbes and Locke and Spinoza and Montesquieu each give a different version of it. Sometimes they present it as the prehistory of the whole race, sometimes a thought experiment, sometimes an exceptional but recurring state of crisis that's especially revealing. But they all contend that to grasp this state of nature is to grasp the deepest truth about the human condition. By nature, we're separate, independent, detached, self-interested, acquisitive individuals. We have no natural end or perfection. We're equal because we're equally vulnerable to violent death and equally endowed with the right to self-defense. This and other basic rights, including the right to acquire property, are possessions that we own as individuals prior to society and that we come into society to protect. And out of this hypothesized human condition, Enlightenment thinkers and especially John Locke, justified the liberal project of resting government on the low but solid foundations of self-interest 
and directing government to the protection of rights and comfortable self-preservation. The paradox is that nobody believes in the state of nature anymore. Nobody has for a long time. Evolution teaches us that early humans weren't solitary but deeply social beings. A second paradox is that this liberal project that appealed to self-interest and the commitment to individual rights worked for a long time as well as it did only because it was supplemented by other commitments and habits that Lockean liberalism didn't provide and was even in tension with, but that our founders also respected and drew on. These included the biblical faith, ideals of statesmanship and civic virtue, going back to the classical republicanism of Greece and Rome, characteristically American habits of collective, collective health, self-help and volunteerism, and the traditional family. A third paradox is that while we don't accept the state of nature as a historical reality, we've come increasingly to believe the story that it tells us about ourselves, that we're self-interested, rights-bearing individuals, each on our own to make whatever we can out of life. A number of observers have connected this shift, this shift in our self-understanding, to a serious fraying of our social fabric. And maybe one of the most critical is Patrick Deneen, who argues in his book, Why Liberalism Failed, that the effort to liberate individuals from all the institutions and traditional traditions that once constrained them have left us individually isolated and weak and helpless in the face of a powerful government that gets stronger and harder to control all the time. Unlike our founders, who spoke confidently of nature and nature's God, to us now nature seems to give no guidance at all. Modern science teaches that nature is blind. Many social scientists deny that humans even have a nature. And with such a view of nature, reason seems to give no guidance either. People claim that reason teaches us facts, but from knowledge about what is, nothing follows about what's good. Direction seems to come only from faiths that we increasingly don't share or from personal preferences that we can't defend. For a long time, our lack of compelling grounding for our principles hardly seemed to matter. We went on as if they needed no grounding. Or we imagined that we could base them on relativism itself. You've all heard the claim that since nothing is really true or false or right or wrong in itself, it's right to give everyone maximum freedom and wrong to interfere with it. I hope the absurdity of that is cl clear just from stating it that way, but we can take it up, if you like, in the discussion. But this view, apart from its illogic, I think has pr proved too thin a food for the human spirit. Human beings need causes to believe in. Now, on both the left and the right, we see a new moral fervor, but with an impoverished moral vocabulary. A vocabulary not of virtues well articulated, but of grievances and assertions of non-negotiable rights. So far, a majority of us still embrace democracy. But as we reject guidance from nature, do we have any grounds for believing in the equal dignity of human beings and in equal rights, except our feelings? And aren't feelings an especially easy thing to change? I'd like to propose that a great deal of what ails America could be improved, and a great deal of what's good about it could be better supported and guided by consulting another older source of our tradition, ancient republicanism, and especially Aristotle, beginning with his different and I think richer anthropology. I think if we could bring Aristotle as a consultant, he would likely say, first, nature is more robust and offers more guidance than you think. You think of yourselves as isolated individuals, but by nature you are political. You think of your relations with one, another's, with one another in terms of rights, and if you remember to add, corresponding duties. But it's better to think of moral and political relations in terms of virtues that are the perfection of our natures, and in terms of the common good, which is also grounded in human nature. 
So how does Aristotle understand human nature? He famous, famously defines a human being as a rational political animal. So first we're animals, and Aristotle's fascinated by animals. Aristotle's biology is a careful study of living beings, each that has its own ordering principle that keeps it at work, being itself, and producing others of its own kind. To know what a living being is, is to know how it works, what it does, and how it functions. Functioning is most obvious with parts. An eye is there to see. To know what an eye is and does is to know what a good eye is and what a defective one is. And the same is true of whole beings. We only understand what a beaver is by understanding what a healthy, thriving beaver is and does. Nature determines not only what a beaver is, but what's good for a beaver. Sorry, you walked in in a very strange point of this lecture about beavers. We're going to get back to human beings in a minute. And we can say a lot about what's good for a beaver, the clean water and trees and freedom it needs, the way it builds dams and eats bark and raises its young, all of which are essential for a good, thriving beaver existence. Like beavers, human beings are beings with needs and desires and vulnerabilities. We can be healthy or sick, and it's health that's good. We're defined by the bodily characteristics of the species, including our way of reproducing. We're beings that Aristotle says naturally strive to overcome our mortality by leaving behind others like ourselves. So it's part of ancient realism to accept our biological nature and to be respectful of the deep ways that it defines us even though it never simply determines us. It's part of the classical approach to take the natural health of the body as a model and to try to understand the health of the soul in an analogous way. So first, we're animals, and second, human beings are political animals. By this, Aristotle means not just that we're clumpy, that we're gregarious, like cows and sheep are, but that we're also social in a way that unites us into ordered wholes. Right from birth, we're embedded in families that we come to love as our own. We love our closest kin and our friends as other selves. Another myself is his phrase. We form groups that compete with other groups, with leaders and followers. We share a profound human inclination to join others in purposeful action first for defense, but also for higher purposes, activities that give life meaning and a share in the noble. Our little groups naturally grow and coalesce until they form self-sufficient sovereign political communities under regimes that profoundly shape all the smaller associations within them. And finally, to call humans political is to say that human nature is most fully realized in one particular kind of sovereign community, a polis, or a free city, large enough to sustain its independence, small enough to unite its citizens with powerful bonds of affection, and small enough to govern itself through collective face-to-face -face deliberations. And here we begin to see the paradoxical meaning of nature in Aristotle's thought, because the polis is both natural and very rare. It's a rare achievement for anybody to um, devise a form of government and life that er is so well suited to our natures. Aristotle connects our political nature to our third and highest defining characteristic, which is reason. And let me read you just a bit of the politics. It's clear then that a human being is more of a political animal than is any bee or any of those animals that live in herds. For nature, as we say, makes nothing in vain. And humans are the only, only animals who possess reasoned speech. This is logos. Voice, of course, serves to indicate what's painful and pleasant. That's why it's also found in the other animals, because their nature has reached a point where they can perceive what's painful and pleasant and express it to each other. But recent speech serves to make plain what's advantageous and harmful, and also what's just and unjust. For it's a particular feature of humans, in contrast to other animals, to have perception of good and bad, just and unjust, and the like, and community in these things makes a household and a city. 
So essential to our political nature, if also transcending our political nature, is this yearning for the noble, for a meaning that lifts us above our merely animal existence with its bodily needs and bodily pleasures. This yearning directs us to public service and heroism, to piety and to philosophy, and yet this directedness to the noble also brings us into conflicts. It leads societies to embrace common faiths and stories and authoritative accounts of life's meaning, and it leads us, and to try to put these beyond question, and it also leads us to challenge these accounts. The fact that we're given to challenging one another is part of what makes us political. But it's also tied to something else in human nature. Aristotle says, in fact, in one way we're even more political than other animals like bees, but in another way we're more independent. He says in the history of animals, a human being is one of the animals that dualizes. We're both political and independent. He stresses our political nature in his ethics and politics where he's giving guidance to legislators and citizens and educators. We all know how self-interested we can be. What we need to understand better in order to live well together is our political nature and the needs it gives us and the uniquely human fulfillment that it makes possible. But it's interesting that Aristotle's whole picture is more complex than that. Now to say that we're naturally political, you might be still thinking, I'm not political, I don't like politics, I'm not interested in it. It's not to say that we all want to rule, but it is to say that we're concerned with what's good and bad, not just for ourselves, but for others, and in some way for our community, and that to thrive we need to be engaged with others on a large scale or a small scale in working for good ends together with others and upholding laws and norms that we affirm as our own and at the same time honor as just. Now if nature gives us a need for meaning and for justice, does it tell us what these are? Not directly, but it does give us clues. First, in our very need for community and hence our need for the civic virtue to sustain it. We see our need for civic virtue through its decay in America today. We all need each other to be law-abiding, to respect the results of elections and the institutions that protect democracy, to be civil to one another, to be informed and vote for good candidates that will work together and put the common good over their partisan advantage. So we need civic virtue from one another, but Aristotle's most serious teacher, teaching about virtue is that it's not primarily what society needs from us, but what we need from ourselves in order to thrive in a life of pur purposeful engagement with the world. Aristotle argues that the active exercise of virtue is the core of happiness. It's not the whole of it, but it's the core of it. In Aristotle's teaching, virtue has a complex relation to nature. Virtue, like the polis, is a perfection of nature that nature itself doesn't simply provide. Virtues like moderation and justice and practical wisdom don't come naturally, and yet living in accordance with them is naturally fulfilling when we achieve it. So here's an analogy. By nature, we don't play tennis but we can still say it's naturally healthy and satisfying to play tennis well, and even that there's a natural way to serve a ball, the way that uses our natural abilities, our muscles and so on, to put maximum speed on the ball with minimal stress on the shoulder. Figuring out how to cultivate virtue and how to live together in self-governing communities is harder than figuring out how to serve a tennis ball, not just because these are more complicated tasks but because there's so much in our nature that also gets in the way. Laziness and greed and narrow selfishness and contentious, irrational impulses that aren't good even for us. Nature doesn't make life simple for us the way it does for beavers. We have to invent our dams and argue with each other and even argue with ourselves about how to do it. But it does give us the foundations for virtue in a natural goodwill that we feel towards our fellows and our community, in the capacity for reason, in, an, in a rudimentary sense of justice and concern with dignity that need educating 
but that give us some direction. And also in the satisfactions of developing these things well. So reflecting on our complex natures, good character needs complex supports. It can't be instilled just by force or fear. It needs inspiring models and examples. It needs habituation and practice supervised with love. It needs practical wisdom to guide it, and that requires extensive education. But it also needs the sanction of law as an ultimate support. Aristotle gives a paradoxical teaching on law and the noble and virtue in the last chapter of the Nicomachean Ethics, which is the transition to the politics. And his first word here is that people who are brought up well to love the noble need only reminders of what's best. And it's those who are badly brought up who need compulsion. But then it turns out that to be good and to stay good, everyone needs law. So why isn't the love of the noble enough? How can virtue be our natural perfection and it's exercised the core of happiness if it also needs compulsion? I think this has several reasons, some lower but others higher. The lower ones are the disorderly impulses that I just spoke of. Those who are worst brought up especially need strong curbs, but at times all of us do. You have to have that thread of flunking out in order to study and benefit yourself as much as you know you really want to do. And even professors have to do the same kind of thing in order to keep our jobs and the respect of our fellows and so on. So our desires and our happiness are not <clears throat> very perfectly aligned. The higher reason, though, is that our political nature is fulfilled only when we act together for a common good and push ourselves collectively in the right direction. Consider the way a decent person who's doing fine financially is willing to pay her taxes and often even happy to do her part, but only so long as other people do too. Decent people don't want to be freeloaders, but they also don't want to be chumps. They want to be part of a community that's working for everyone. Or consider the Ukrainians fighting bravely for their freedom and freedom everywhere. Even Ukraine with the best cause in the world had to stop men from fleeing the country at the start of the war. And their army, like every army, needs discipline. But precisely in pulling together with the help of good laws to do what's best, they're exercising their political nature and even exercising their freedom as they're fighting for it in the best kind of way. And finally, virtue needs law because Laws in the classical understanding embody a community's most solemn, even sacred recognition of the justice that has a claim on each member. So classically understood law is constraining, but also guiding, community forging, and meaning defining. As political beings, it's hard for us to maintain seriousness about things that the law treats as merely a matter of indifference. For all these reasons, Aristotle denies that acting well is simply a matter of individual choice or, to use another anachronism, free will. We all know that if you grow up in a bad, in a broken family, in a broken neighborhood, your chances of coming out well are not good. But Aristotle would say we aren't drawing the right conclusions from this. He would criticize equally the liberals who want the law to be enforced more leniently and the conservatives who imagine that the country's responsibilities are met with law enforcement and who fail to take seriously our responsibility to prevent everyone from going wrong in the first place. This whole teaching about humans' political nature is controversial, but I think Aristotle is right about it, and that the crisis of modern liberalism is due in no small part to our neglect of its importance. I also think it offers a better way of grounding our liberal principle of equality and of human dignity. Aristotle is not a Democrat. He doesn't teach that we were all created simply equal, but he does argue that we were all created equally human, and he gives this a rich meaning that I've been trying to spell out. We share not only the lower needs of the body, but the higher needs of the soul. Our capacities differ in degree, but they're similar in kind. We all share a nature 
that can be perfected and needs to be perfected by the virtues of character and intellect through education. And to live well in a free, thriving community, we all need one another to be good. And we all need good laws. But what guides law? Aristotle devotes the fifth book of his Nicomachean Ethics to justice or right, DK, and the peak of that discussion is his famous but cryptic teaching on natural right. He introduces his discussion of natural right by confronting squarely the ancient relativists who deny that anything is right by nature. And he concedes that laws and conceptions of justice differ so much from place to place that some people concede justice is all by convention. Aristotle grants that part of it is. Think of our traffic laws as a perfect example. But he insists that behind the particulars, like stopping at a red light, is a natural part of justice, which has, he says, the same power everywhere, and yet it's all changeable. So how can it be universal and yet changeable? It's changeable because in real life on the ground, justice is a messy matter of balancing competing claims. Complaints of, uh, claims of different individuals and groups, claims of different elements, different kinds of fairness that sometimes conflict. But the core meaning of justice for Aristotle is the common good, which he suggests is never perfect, but unless law and order is completely broken down, it's always there to be found and it's always worth finding and pursuing. Guidance for justice comes from understanding the hierarchy of human goods that include the goods of the body, like safety and health, as essential but lower, and the higher goods of the soul, like friendship and the moral and intellectual virtues. A healthy society needs laws that reflect these priorities and leaders who know how to apply them, and in extreme cases, to make exceptions who understand when the lower needs urgently need to be given precedence over the higher, for example, in restrictions on free speech in wartime, and when the higher need to prevail even at some cost to the lower. So Aristotle's teaching on natural right is not a teaching about rights as absolute universal possessions of individuals prior to society. It's also not a teaching about natural law something promulgated by nature directly to the conscience that tells us all what's right in the form of rules or absolute prohibitions. Aristotle's suggestion is there aren't any rules that are always good to follow because in extreme cases there are exceptions. But rather it's a teaching about natural right as something flexible but determinate because it's grounded in human nature and its needs. To say that natural right has the same power everywhere means, I think, that there's always a best thing to do, even if it's hard to find, and that the best thing to do is the right thing to do. It means there's no obligation to do the impossible, and it's never wrong to do the best possible, even if it's the lesser of two evils. So in Aristotelian terms, individual rights are not possessions we bring to society, but maybe they're best conceived of as powers that we collectively put into the hands of individuals in order to protect us all against oppression. It's something that we do together for a common purpose. And the United States has actually tried to enshrine rights in this spirit, but we lack the categories for thinking about them, and so the efforts erode. For example, the Second Amendment, freedom to bear arms, was explicitly tied to a common project, a power that the community was putting in the hands of individual citizens so that they could participate in the common project of a, of a militia. I think if we thought about rights in this way, not as absolute possessions, but as useful instruments that we're using to keep all of us safe, they might divide us less. Now, all these considerations put Aristotle largely on the side of strong political communities preferably small, homogeneous ones, with rich local traditions, a shared religion, widespread political participation, and active military service. The ancient polis is his ideal. And he's not simply a Democrat, of course. He thinks the best practicable regime is a mixture of democracy and aristocracy. 
But there are two important elements in Aristotle's thought that help bridge the gap between his perspective and modern liberalism. One is this teaching on natural right as something both grounded in nature and adaptable. Just as natural right doesn't demand that we do the impossible, it doesn't demand that we try to be a different people from the one we are, but only that we try to become the best possible version of ourselves that we can. And the second thing that helps to bridge the gap is this thought that I mentioned of Aristotle's that a human being is one of the animals that dualizes. So this, this dual character makes us sometimes destructively selfish as well as political, but it also has some positive meanings. One of them is this, that we do better when we have, as individuals, we do better when we have a degree of self-sufficiency. Aristotle says independent farmers with their self-reliance are the backbone of a good republic. That's an idea that Jefferson picked up and that Franklin adapted with his embrace of small self-reliance, skilled tradesmen and entrepreneurs. This celebration of self-sufficiency is an important part of the American ethos. Our task is not to overcome it, but to balance it with better sources of connection. Another implication of humans' dual nature for Aristotle is this that the very highest perfections and fulfillments human beings are capable of transcend the political community. Aristotle says that the city isn't the highest thing, the divine is the highest thing, and human life comes the closest to the divine in philosophic contemplation. A whole political city or nation can't contemplate, only individuals can in private and in ways that are necessarily in some tension with <clears throat> a strong, healthy community, since philosophy necessarily involves radical questioning. This is a tension that Aristotle thinks has to be managed. It can't ever simply be overcome. But his respect for both sides of it gives him more of an affinity for an open, tolerant society like ancient Athens and less of an affinity for a closed communal society like Sparta than we might have expected. So what might Aristotle say is the best version of the United States we should aim for and the course correction that we most need in light of all this? We embrace freedom. This is our strength. Freedom rethought with Aristotle's help can be an organizing principle for our shared pursuit of both dignity and meaning. Freedom for us has always meant both freedom for individuals to choose their own direction in life and freedom for communities to govern themselves. But we tend to think of individual freedom as an increasingly absolute freedom to do whatever we want and be whoever we want. And when this comes into conflict with the community's attempts to collectively self-set norms, we clash and we don't know how to resolve the conflict. And in fact, we have a bad conscience about even trying to set norms. We're confident in defending collective actions mainly just to prevent people from being harmed or to defend their rights. We aren't confident about do or to give them material resources. We aren't confident about doing it to make life more meaningful or our communities stronger or our souls better. We're especially suspicious of trying to promote virtue. We think of that as paternalism and anathema to freedom. Isn't that what the Iranian morality police were doing, punishing women for not wearing the hijab? Shouldn't virtue be a private matter, we tend to think. Aristotle would say we need to think of our freedom differently, as something both nobler and more demanding. Freedom is never good when it's just a lack of constraint when it's just willful self-assertion. These aren't even really freedom, any more than a person in the grips of an addiction is free to take the drugs or gambling. I've stayed away from all that so far. I've just been here one day. Real freedom means taking responsibility for yourself, being master of your own ship. And for that, you have to know the ship, you have to know where you're going, you have to have self-control, and you have to have an understanding of what's worth doing. Aristotle argues that it takes considerable virtues of heart and mind to achieve real freedom in this full sense, and that these, 
These virtues require a serious education and a community of like-minded people to sustain the effort. I think he would say we need to pour much more effort and resources and honor and treasure into educating every young American to be truly free, both as an individual and as a citizen. Iran is not free. Its government is a small extremist party using the forces of the modern state to oppress a people that don't share its ideology. A free community upholds its own norms and nurtures the higher life of the spirit in its own way. But if you, even if we agree that what matters is not just the goods of the body or the freedom of being left alone, even if we agree that the good life needs meaning, what do we do about the fact that today we live in a large, diverse society whose members don't agree about what that meaning should be? Here I think we have a great resource in our own American tradition of pursuing liberty in different ways on different levels. With federalism and localism, our First Amendment protections of assembly and religion, an Aristotelian reform might begin with giving more thought and support to all the small associations that Tocqueville identifies as a healthy force in American society, counterbalancing the individualistic tendency that he worried about. So this would include the small neighborhood and civic associations, churches, synagogues, mosques, book clubs, parent-run schools, charitable associations, all these organizations and activities that make up the sphere of civil society in between the private sphere of individuals and families and the public sphere of laws and courts. Aristotle's principles don't support a liberalism understood as merely a framework to protect the private sphere so that we can each make money and live as we please. But they do support liberalism understood as a system of layered liberties, a framework for protecting private individuals and the families, but especially for protecting and fostering the small communities of meaning that we need in order to pursue the higher goods of the soul by choice together. We can talk more in the discussion about what this might look like concretely, but here are a couple of suggestions. One would build on Jefferson's ideas, idea that schools run by parents can be a good exercise of collective liberty and a good nursery for democracy. Why not expand charter schools and even have a system of all charter schools of all kinds, including parochial ones, also including common neighborhood schools that make a deliberate per, um, pursuit of bringing people together across divides getting parents involved and allowing the parents to choose which one they want and help to run it. A second suggestion would be something that's been floated a number of times, a system of universal youth service after high school or college. Everyone could choose how and where to serve, maybe in the National Guard, maybe in a hospital or an environmental group or a faith-based charity, but everyone would be expected to do so and encouraged to continue volunteering in some way afterwards. Aristotle would say it's important to get the law behind these things and to enshrine in our natural, national collective um, project of self-governance ways of encouraging these small communities that were healthier in the 19th century than they are now, but that are such an important part of who we are. Living freely isn't easy. It turns out to be one of the hardest things that anyone has tried to do, but it's a worthy challenge. And I think Aristotle would agree with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, pushback, objections? Yes. Excuse me, uh, I am Sridhiman Banerjee, a uh, political science PhD, international PhD student here from India. Uh, what I want to ask, uh, what I want to say is that while Aristotle's liberty is a very good way to describe the political situation in America, from what I see in the eyes of a foreigner here, 
I also want to say that uh, maybe another thinker would be very good. It's Rabindranath Tagore from India. What when he wrote his books, he was writing on the context of the Indian freedom movement, and he had written that that America, the patriotism of freedom cannot be sacrificed at the altar of humanity. I believe that the I believe that the only, the only way to change what's happening over here is to encourage a sense of humanity among people. And without that, I think it's impossible. I think that's a very good point. And I think in today's world, we need humanity. That's one of the virtues that we do especially need. Um, it's hard. It's hard to have a sense of humanity when you're at, at war or you know, in deep enmity with the people who are closest to you. So I think part of what Aristotle is doing with the stress on small communities is trying to be realistic about how far our human attachments and concerns and sympathies naturally reach. And I think there's a worry that we try to be philanthropic and worry about people around the other side of the world and we're letting our own democracy degrade. But I agree with you completely, we, we need both. You know, Aristotle has his catalog of 11 virtues that are reasonable virtues that we all recognize as important, things like justice and courage and so on. But humanity is not one of those and maybe it should be added. Charity is another one. You know, we have Christian virtues. We have to find the, the virtues that matter here and find a way to weave them together so that we've got a common vision of who we're trying to be as people. Hi, yes. Hi, I have a question about education. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I know you mentioned uh, at a certain point there that uh, we really want people to um, fulfill their potential for, for liberty, for human freedom. You need, and it sounds like you were saying, something like a liberal education that will foster that kind of development. Um, I'm curious, though, your, about your final point. I just wonder if you could, you could say more about this idea of parent-run schools. Because um, I, I grew up in a small town, and the idea of uh, there was one school, so like the idea that all the parents would sort of get together and hash out a group, that actually seems fine for that. But thinking about a big city like Las Vegas, and you would have sort of the, the charter school system with parent-run schools, it would be very, very easy for me to imagine some very ideologically driven you know, schools uh, that would maybe not serve young students especially well. Um, terms of opening their minds to their own freedoms possibilities. So I'm just curious about that plan that you kind of mentioned there at the end of the talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really good points. Um, if I could take first your thought about liberal education, yes, it's really valuable. And we need all of our future leaders as much as possible to have had a real liberal education. And one of the things that it does, I think, is just to slow us down and to sober us up and to help us to see how the big questions are hard questions and help us to understand where different people are coming from and help to develop that practical wisdom that Aristotle talks about. But I do think that most of what we need is not that so much as a good education in K through 12, a good education of citizens you can get a lot of wonderful history and stories and civics lessons into the schools if you're trying hard to do that and turn out great citizens who might be welders or whatever. The public schools, for the most part, are not doing that job very well. And I think, reluctantly, it might be time to break them up or to force them to compete. So. I think the more common schools we have, the better. The reason I want to lean into the idea of supporting parochial schools, as they do in Canada, you know, the Catholic, it's a weird thing in Canada, there was a Protestant and a Catholic school system in the major cities, and there was almost nobody else when those were set up. 
So those were the two. Then the Protestant schools became the school for everybody as you know, the Sikhs started coming and so on. So we now have a, a school system, a public school system and a Catholic school system equally funded. Well, they should reopen that again to everybody else. Those are sources of great good, great moral education. The Catholics do a great job of that for the most part. And as you say, the possibility for problems. So we would have to think hard about how to, how to regulate that gently, carefully, but demand. There are principles that need to be taught. There are stories that need to be taught. I think the more information parents have about what's going on, the, the better. And I think what we especially need is good textbooks and good curriculums and um, materials for teachers, which might be best developed right now in small laboratories of little communities. But there's no easy answer to that. Yeah. I also had a question about like the last couple of like suggestions that you were posing uh -huh. because you talked about things like um, parent-run schools or parent-involved schools, and then this mandatory volunteering for young people. Um, but it seems well, it's not volunteering if it's mandatory. <laughs> mandatory public service. Yeah, you're right. But um, so those things are time commitments, um, clearly. And I was just thinking that you were talking at the beginning of the lecture about these these divisions in our country: rich, poor, left, right. And a lot of those divisions do come from inequality, financial inequality, capital inequality. And it just seems to me that putting burdens on people's time without first addressing the sources of inequality could just further that inequality, which would inevitably create more division. Because if you're taking working age adults, young adults, straight out of high school, and you are keeping them from working a full-time job to support someone, to support their family, to support their children that they might already have, mm -hmm. it just seems like that would make division Worse, maybe. Okay, yeah, very good. And so you need to, I mean, you want to start with something that the president is encouraging and try to get people and foundations to be providing resources for the kinds of situations you're talking about. And it can't be heavy handed because this is a freedom loving country, but it could be something that we make honorable and we expect. And that we re reward, you know, maybe with help with a down payment or college assistance or something like that. But I think you also raise a really good point about the depths of the inequality. What are we doing about that? Aristotle keeps coming back to education. What every political community most needs to do is to educate its citizens to be good citizens in that community. And for, that, for us, that means we've got to raise the floor. We've got to raise it enormously. We have doctors who are honored and rich, who are curing the problems with our bodies, and I'm very glad they're there. But the people who are educating our minds and shaping our souls should be even better honored and respected and paid. And money matters, you know. If you're paid $40,000 a year, the world is telling you that's all you're worth. And that's not good. So this is, you know, I'm being very idealistic. I'm sketching out what it would take. There's nothing that I'm describing that we haven't done or some liberal democracy isn't doing somewhere. You know, the Finns and the people in Singapore do a great job of educating all their children. But it would be, it would take a real change of mindset. Yes? I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about American pluralism and diversity, because it seems to me that if Aristotle's advice would be for us to go to parent-centered, parent-driven schools, community institutions that reflect our homogeneous small community, that even what you mentioned in terms of national service or public service, where um, some people can go work for an environmental group if those are their community or family values, and other people can go work for the Second Amendment group. And, you know, <laughs> presume, like, how yeah. do you choose between those values? And doesn't it just lead to resegregation into homogeneous but at odds communities? 
Okay, good. So that's the same question as, as with, the, with the charter schools. We need both. We need a civic education that brings us all together, and maybe that needs to be nationally mandated or all but mandated. The problem is we can't agree about it. So it, the best thing is for some of us to get serious about producing that and trying to persuade other people to join in educating their citizens with good stories, with a, a study of history that is honest and tells the truth, but we need like 80, 90% hopeful stories and accounts of what we're trying to be and what's good about the country and much smaller amounts of discouraging stories that were just awful and irredeemable. We need to teach critical thinking, but we also even more need to teach respectful thinking and hopeful thinking. Because critical thinking is very often, what goes under the words of name of critical thinking is often teaching cynicism, teaching that, yeah, everybody's really out for themselves. The politicians are all crooks. It's all hopeless. That's poison for the soul. It's not that bad. So these, the pluralism. Um, I wonder if it isn't possible for us to agree that there are different versions of freedom and different versions of a good life that have family, that are members of the same family. To think harder about what freedom requires for all of us, the knowledge that it requires, the virtues of character that it requires. And I think there is, there are a lot of commonalities there. Everybody knows that being fair to one another, being civil and decent to one another, being honest, working hard, taking responsibility for yourself, those are good things. But we don't teach them as seriously as we should. OK, fire back at me. Well, I mean, so we have a Supreme Court that is elevating religious exceptionalism over civic values like civil rights. So are you thinking about the overturning Roe v. Wade? Give me an example. The, the bakery not, uh, not being, uh, okay. the bakery not being compelled to make a cake for gay and lesbian customers, despite the state law that says there can be quality uh, of those services. So, I mean, maybe, ha, 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 what would Eric Buckle say about that? Because to me, that is a direct conflict of two things that it would seem be as we should elevate. Mm -hmm. I suspect he would agree with you about that case, and I would agree with you about that case, that religious liberty does not mean and shouldn't mean exemptions from generally applicable laws. And you know, more fundamentally, I think the Supreme Court should, for a long time, have just been much more modest in saying what the law is and leaving it to legislatures to hash out those kinds of things and figure out what the law should be. But to go back to, to go back to this question of pluralism, you know, we think of ethics now in terms of positions that we take. And when we teach, try to teach ethics in the school, it's often teaching people to think in the right way about the right causes. And then we disagree violently about what those right causes are. Aristotle would say that's not what ethics is about. Ethics is about character. Ethics is about having the character to understand both sides of those arguments and to be moderate. We need a lot more moderation. We need a lot more sobriety. We need a lot more good faith efforts to reach across divides, and that's something we need to be modeling and teaching our children from the beginning. And then those problems would become less intractable. But we've, 
we've for the most part given up on teaching virtues and we're trying to teach attitudes in schools and that's doing more harm than good. Very much so. Yes. Um, what is, is there a difference like, like between a polis and um, like a state or just like any kind of community? And do you think Aristotle believed that, um, well, that the, like everybody should be citizens in a polis and um, should have a shared responsibility, or that there are certain people who, who um, must, due to natural right, be excluded, and um, would that be at odds with um, some of the notions of like American freedom and um, mm -hmm. well, like pluralism, and that everybody is endowed with certain natural rights. Yes, okay, both good questions. So the difference between, you know, the word polis is often translated city-state, and that's a kind of awkward translation that conveys the fact that for us, we think of a community, we think of society, and then we think of the state. The state is the government with its laws and its apparatus of, of law enforcement and so on, and agencies that do things that are not us. For the ancient Greeks, the polis was us. We are the polis, a community. And it was necessarily small because it had to involve everybody in some way, all the free citizens anyway. So this division between society and government was not something that they, not a way that they saw it, but rather they understood the political regime to be, you know, aristocracy or democracy, to be the ordering of the society which involves not just who's in charge, but what way of life and what type of human being are we foregrounding and making our model? Is it the gentleman? Is it the yeoman farmer? Is it the warrior? Um, that person defines the regime and defines the community. And this goes with the thought that we're fundamentally political social beings and not fundamentally individuals who set up the state to do certain limited things for us. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. On the question of inclusion of everybody, Aristotle wrestles hard with that. And he's not a, uh, he's not a Democrat because he thinks that liberal education is extremely important and in a world where there was no technology, very few people could have and give their children the leisure to get a liberal education. And so he was willing to put up with a certain tension and certain inequalities that we're not willing to put up with in order to have those things that he thought were such precious accomplishments of the soul that involved the wonderful arts and drama and poetry and architecture that enriched the whole city for everybody. But we would say, but it still isn't fair that everyone doesn't have the same, the same rights. And he saw aristocracy and democracy in real life. Now, aristocracy is an ideal. What it normally was at best was a kind of oligarchy uh, ruled by the rich. He sees democracy as fundamentally ruled by the poor. And he says, one problem with the poor is that they care too much about money. Well, the rich care too much about money too, but the poor especially are concerned with money and, and security and, and, and wealth. And it's only, this is very paradoxical, but it's only those people who have enough money that most reliably can rise above it and think it's not what's most important to them. It's these higher things of the soul. So what he's interested in trying to sketch in the politics is a way to combine and balance these different regimes to get the best that's attainable. And one of the interesting features is, he says, um, the democratic mode of putting people into office is by lot. The aristocratic way is election. So we have an aristocratic element in our government right here. And he said, if, says, if you take an, an oligarchy and you allow everybody to elect the leaders, even if they're electing them from the upper class, it becomes more aristocratic. 
because everybody is choosing people who are better, and it's not simply a closed oligarchy. So I think he would say to us, um, we actually have a system that is a kind of mixed regime. It's partly democratic and partly aristocratic. We just need to think harder about how to make it both fairer and more aristocratic. Thomas Jefferson, of all people, said the most important thing a government needs to do is find a way to put the best people into office. So we need to teach young people your right to vote is not a right to just choose whoever you feel like choosing. To represent yourself, it's a responsibility to help us put the very best people into office because we haven't figured out any better way to do that. And it's a sacred responsibility then that we all share. So I think, you know, he would say, yes, democracy is very good given the alternatives, but find a way to elevate it. Yes. I personally am so much influenced by Aristotle that I think the most important thing is the character of the people that we elect to Congress and the presidency. And if they were really good people, they could figure it out. We wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with all of what they, all of what they decide, but we're electing people to be our tools. And that's a disaster. And they're not solving our problems. Yes. That would be a fair question of me if I were running for office. You know, how are you going to persuade everybody of this? How are you going to do it? I don't know. I really don't. I'm, I'm interested in sketching out what, what direction we should be trying to point our ship in, what it would look like. And I think that where this might be most valuable is just in helping individuals to think about where to put their energies and how to educate their children and getting some healthier small communities that are educating people better, that are delivering social services in a way that really nurtures the spirit and doesn't just put money in the pockets of people who have broken lives. But I think trying to turn the country around is, is a huge task. And I'm not terribly optimistic about it. David, you were next. Well, I, I wonder whether Aristotle might focus on uh, free, the, the idea of freedom as Americans understand it, as you mentioned, as largely being left alone to do what we want to do, whether that would be his focus. Because it seems to me one of the obstacles to getting Americans to take Aristotle seriously is that the Declaration of Independence tells us we have the right to pursue happiness, but doesn't tell us what it is. Mm -hmm. But Aristotle tells us what it is, mm -hmm. and furthermore tells us that most of us are capable of it at its highest level. Mm, at its so, very highest level, yes. yes. At the highest level of the highest level, but we're all capable of becoming more rational, and that's good for all of us. And we're all capable of becoming better citizens, and that's good for all of us. So this pursuit of happiness, you know, I think he would say, okay, I don't think, I don't agree with you, Jefferson, that governments were instituted to protect rights, but they were instituted to protect right, which is the common good. 
and to help you in the pursuit of happiness. And you've got to do that together with others in a community. None of us, including Aristotle, is smart enough to figure it out all by ourselves. You know, he had Plato to teach him, and he had Socrates to teach him. And Socrates had a circle, a community of people who were working together to try to understand the nature of things. But we've sort of forgotten that, and we imagine we can each just make up the meaning of life for ourselves. And Aristotle would say, no, that you're going to come up with something really hokey and stupid if you try to do that. And not only are we subjectivists when it comes to happiness, but we tend to think, see happiness as just a feeling. Yeah. I feel happy, therefore I'm happy. Yeah. So Aristotle would have to fight that too. Mm-hmm. So eudaimonia that is translated happiness, it's, it's human thriving. It's human fulfillment. And you can feel good and, and be completely deluded, and that's not happiness. Yeah. Mark. Yeah. Um, and about um, what it would mean to educate us to be free and the virtues of free human being. Um, what are, what's that? Is, have you given mind some conception of freedom that you find in Aristotle? Mm -hmm. Aristotle generally says that the purpose of political life is to make us, um, make us more virtuous, or not, not more free. And I'm wondering if, uh, if that's, you know, the, the people have claimed that they deserve to rule because they contribute freedom, but he's not satisfied with that. Mm -hmm. So what, what is freedom in there? What kind of freedom do you have in mind? Is it, is it a, a quasi-Aristotelian freedom that's adapted for liberal political society? I think it's a somewhere between quasi-Aristotelian and truly Aristotelian. So I'm modifying it, but you know, this is another one of his gripes against the demos, the people. He says they think freedom is just doing whatever they feel like. But they're wrong about that. That's not freedom. And in fact, we need to collectively, we need to live under law, and we need to be collectively pursuing what's truly good. And he suggests that that's freedom, more so. Collective self-rule, intelligent collective self-rule. And of course, he and the other Greeks also talk about liberal education, free education, the education for a free human being as a higher level of freedom than political freedom, the freedom of the mind. So that's, that's also important. And I think it's mainly a difference of emphasis that instead of the individual freedom to do whatever you want, it's collective self-rule is the really valuable freedom, or freedom of the mind, freedom to question. Me. Yeah. So, uh, we've kind of touched on this, but he does talk about people that aren't part of society, and with your focus on like making us more rational and, and more, more citizen-focused, there are, it does seem to be, people that he's willing to leave behind. Those people that he says, um, I don't remember exactly his qualifications right now, but that I think it's about working together in a rational community. If you're not willing to do that, you either must be a god or a beast, right? Um, the person who's not a citizen is easy, either a god or a beast, right. yeah. And so doesn't that present a problem of being able to justify? Like, well, these people are not rational. Almost like the same problem that I would say like Mill would have, like relying on, on rationality and being able to disqualify people based on rationality, from not being included and into this, into our place. I think you would say, as we would say, well, they, they disqualify themselves if they refuse to live by the law. Then we have to lock them up. I mean, they're still citizens, but they're not, they're not partners in the community if they do that. So the law is one thing, but who decides who's rational or not? So what you're saying, you're not rational if you don't follow the law? Um, no, I don't think Aristotle says there's a minimum amount of rationality that you need in order to be able to be a citizen. Obviously, if you're, you know, seriously impaired and you can't speak, then you can't be a member of the community. Um, but that statement about whoever's not part of a community is either a beast or a god, I think he means to say virtually everybody properly is. And at first, it's, it's interesting, at first it sounds like he's saying, well, there are some people who are so far above the rest of us and others who are so far below the rest of us that they don't fit into a political community. But then he later says, we all need law. So.
So even, I think, the very most gifted also need that discipline and that, that structure, at least initially, okay. in order to... Worry if we're, because of your unsolved stories, and I actually agree, and I think stories are super important, but if we're going to spend, you said 90% of our stories should be about what's hopeful no. when we're teaching our... our uh, 80% I'll... I threw that number out, but, <laughs> but I think that's, that's worrisome because there are a lot of people who live in situations where they don't see the country as being hopeful mm -hmm. and so to just focus on the hopeful side of it denies their past and their experience and so already excludes them and so i'm i'm coming back to this worry about excluding certain people yeah from yeah from this whole endeavor but you can tell about terrific adversity stories about people who are meeting and living through and growing stronger through hard things that are presented in an unvarnished way. But I think often the story that we tell kids is society is stacked against you and it's just going to crush certain people and there's nothing that anybody can do about it and it's just unjust. I was a, I was a teacher, I taught English for a year in history for a year in high school and I was given the textbooks I had to teach and the stories in that English literature book, many of them were just so depressing and discouraging. And that's the kind of thing that I think can be turned around so that you have, you know, even some people who are being crushed and who are losing out, and you see that happening, but you've got a hero that you can look to and say, yes, I can be like that. Our souls need that. You're shaking your head. No, no, the person behind you is shaking his head. Yeah, well, I'm not talking about dream world heroes. I'm talking about real people. I come from one of the poorest countries in the world. I have seen adversity. And I have seen some, I have seen lots of people dying trying to emerge victorious. I have seen that. Lots of people dying. Dying trying to emerge victorious, failing. Yeah. I have seen. And I think that if we try to deny that reality, then we just set ourselves up for a worse reaction. I agree. But there are different ways of presenting any reality. And to be realistic and hopeful at the same time are not an impossible combination. That's what I'm, that's what I'm asking for. Yes? In the blue, yeah. Um, what do you think Aristotle, how would he react to what I think is one of the most important modern ideas that comes through social science, which is we are not rational. We behave maybe in the future, or maybe from Aristotle's perspective, as a matter of, in, in, of not having perfected virtue. Uh -huh. We are irrational. We know people are deeply irrational and don't behave as rational beings. Interesting. Well, you know, he says we're, we're the animals that possess logos, reason, speech. And we definitely do possess it. And we definitely do misuse it. And I think that goes with the fact that he thought healthy societies generally need a shared religion to tell people what to think. We're not individually that good at getting the truth on our own. And so he thought that there was a, you know, our, our whole system is based on this enlightenment hopefulness. We can just dispel the clouds of monkish superstition and we can live all of us really well in the light of the truth that we're all pursuing together. And our commitment to free speech and academic freedom are based on that. And that's, and we're all committed to those things. And yet, I think Aristotle would say at the least, you're being awfully confident and hopeful and maybe careless in assuming we can just have a free for all. We can just, everybody say what they think and put it out there on the internet. 
and the truth is going to emerge, and that's naive. So um, when, I was, when I referred a few minutes ago to the need not only for critical thinking, but for respectful, even reverential thinking, that goes with the fact that we need people to follow, most of us. All of us need people to follow. And we should, question, we should find the best authorities we can and question them very cautiously. So that in a society that's committed to free speech and freedom of inquiry, I think we need all the more a civic education that tells a story for all of us about what matters and what's good. And most of us need other smaller communities of meaning religious communities or study groups or something of that sort to help us. And the, what's worst is when it becomes atomized and everybody's just throwing their thoughts out there and liking things and retweeting things that are not getting us closer to the truth, but just the opposite. So it's part of why he was not simply on the side of, of uh, an open society. And that's where I think small communities that have good leaders are, are essential. Time for one more question. Okay. Go ahead. No, please, go ahead. Um, can you say a little bit more about um, the natural masters and natural slaves? Oh, okay. <laughs> It's very strange, yeah. Your first question was pointed. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was trying to. I was trying to avoid it. So Aristotle says that slavery is by nature. Okay. Then he gives a definition of the natural master and the natural slave, and it turns out the natural slave doesn't exist. It's a null set. It's somebody whose body is useful, and who is not capable of running, managing his own life at all. Who doesn't have enough intelligence. To, doesn't have practical intelligence. And the natural master then is somebody who's capable of taking care of the slave and making, creating a common good in that situation. So you would have to be severely mentally retarded and at the same time very skilled in order to be a useful natural slave. So what is Aristotle doing with that? He does the same thing with women. You know, he says, there's this funny thing that Republican rule is people taking turns ruling and being ruled. And he says marriage is a kind of Republican arrangement where there's a basic equality between the husband and the wife. The only little difference is it's always the husband who rules and the wife never gets her turn. And he talks about the virtues of a woman and the virtues of a man and the virtues of a woman are a little different. One of them includes silence. And he quotes Sophocles' Ajax, where Tecmessa, the wife, is saying to the raving, stark raving mad Ajax, who's about to go out and murder some people. Oh, he's about to go out and slaughter all the sheep, thinking that it's the leaders of the, of the army. Ajax, where are you going? Go back to bed. And Ajax says, silence in a woman is an ornament. You should be silent. So Aristotle quotes that sort of seeming to be supporting the patriarchal relationship between men and women and actually completely undercutting it. And what is he doing? I think he is, he knows that if he were to try to overturn the slave basis of Athenian society, Greek society, and overturn traditional marriage, he would just create a mess. But he's interested in planting all kinds of seeds for thoughtful people to see the limitations of those, to reflect on them, to do what they can with those insights over time. But what he's doing is the same thing that I'm thinking we should be trying to do, which is taking the flawed society that he lived in and saying, how can this be a better version of what it is? And his effort there in ancient Greece is to try to make the top higher and not immediately to do anything about the bottom. I want to bring up the bottom, because I think we need to, because we're a democracy. But it's another version of the same project. Thank you. Thank you.